Let's take a look at the code in this LabVIEW project. We'll begin with a relatively high-level bird's eye view of the project and then start getting into the details later. Let's begin with the producer loop. Here's the producer loop on top, just a conventional while loop, and it contains an event structure and a case structure known as the guard clause. The event structure has a subdiagram that executes for each one of the various front panel buttons that we have. So each time you click one of those front panel buttons, you execute a particular set of code in the event structure. We have connect and disconnect, a disconnect, the reset button, and so on. Each one of these, again, is sending a particular command down to the producer loop. When the air cluster is clear, we see nothing happening inside the guard clause, but if there is an air detected, then the command to shut down the system is immediately enqueued. Next, let's review the overall structure of the consumer loop. The consumer loop iteration begins with the guard clause. The DQ element function waits for the producer loop to insert a command into the queue. The shutdown state is immediately selected if the air cluster coming into the guard clause carries an error. The state and arguments subvi separates the command into state and optional parameter, and these are separated by the colon. The case structure contains code to run for each one of the various commands generated by the producer loop. For example, the connect state, or the connect command, causes this panel to run. Let's finish up this overall review by considering the front panel indicators and setting up the queue. All of the front panel indicators here are bound variables. That is, they're bound to the network published shared variables which are hosted on the real-time target. Here the command queue is created and we enqueue the first command, initialize and that gets used by the consumer loop. This wire conveys the reference to the queue, and eventually that needs to be released before the VI shuts down, and we do so only after both the producer and consumer loops have stopped. Now let's consider the normal operation sequence for the producer loop. The producer loop on top responds to all of the front panel controls with an event structure. For example, we have the front panel stop button, and you can also use the escape key to activate that. This stop button causes the shutdown state to be enqueued directly at the head or the top of the queue. The connect button. Clicking the connect button activates this subdiagram of the event structure and enqueues the connect state. The disconnect button enqueues the disconnect state, and the reset button enqueues the send state with this parameter. Take a quick look down at the consumer loop. State and arguments subvi separates out the send state from the parameter after the colon. After the state has been enqueued, we exit the event structure and move into the guard clause. If there's no error, we take no action and then wait for more activity on the front panel. Let's consider the normal operation sequence for the consumer loop. At the beginning of the loop iteration, the guard clause waits for the producer loop to insert a command into the queue. So this function will block until a command becomes available. The command is separated into the desired state and the optional arguments. The initialize state takes care of um, ensuring that the front panel controls are set to their proper initial values. The connect state uh, fundamentally creates the network stream writer endpoint, takes care of manipulating some of the um, enabled states for the front panel controls. Disconnect sends the disconnect message to the real-time target, ensures that that message is received, and then destroys the network stream endpoint. Again, it also manipulates the front panel control enable states. The send function, uh, discussed a little bit earlier, makes use of the optional parameter here, or the optional argument. 
So the argument is sent directly as the message to the real-time target. The shutdown state invokes a virtual button click on the front panel and then sends a boolean true to stop the loop. And the final state catches any messages from the producer loop that are unexpected and then inserts that into the air cluster. Once we're done, we go back and wait for another command from the producer loop. Let's take a look at the shutdown sequence of the VI when you click the stop button. Click the stop button and that selects this subdiagram of the event structure. That enqueues the shutdown state and then we feed a boolean true out to the loop condition and that stops the producer loop. The shutdown state was enqueued at the top of the queue, therefore we immediately select the shutdown state feed the boolean true out, and the loop stops. Both loops have stopped, and that causes the queue to be released, and we're done. An error generated in the producer loop will also cause a shutdown. Suppose the error cluster coming out of the event structure carries an error. That selects this subdiagram. We enqueue the shutdown state, but then we're now waiting for some action on the front panel. The shutdown state is detected, and we feed a true out, and that will stop the loop, but not before we've done a virtual click on the stop button. That virtual click of the stop button causes the producer loop to quit, and then we're done. And finally, an error generated in the consumer loop also causes the VI to shut down. Imagine we have an error on the cluster at this point, the guard clause detects that and feeds in the shutdown state, which causes this loop to stop. Just before stopping, it does a virtual click on the front panel stop button. That selects uh, this shutdown state, but we've already done that. So we feed the true out, that stops the top loop, and we are done. So three, three possible reasons for stopping the VI. All right, last thing, let's take a look at how to modify the controller for your own application. I'm going to concentrate on creating a new button for the producer loop and then giving some life to that button in the consumer loop. I'm gonna zip through the details here fairly quickly. You might need to pause and replay periodically if you're trying to follow along. Let's go up to the event structure and I need to add an event case for this new button that's been added. This is okay. The problem is is that it's empty code. So let me undo that one and let's try duplicate event case instead. So I associate that with new button and it automatically connected connect to and let's remove that and insert the new button control. And I'll give this a, a new command called new button. Down in the consumer loop then we'll need to add a subdiagram to handle that command from the producer loop. Again you have a number of options about how you add new cases. What works best I think is to try to find one that is close to what you're trying to do already. Although you can certainly add with just a blank slate if necessary if that seems easier. So then you would you would type in the name of this subdiagram is new button. And I'll create a little pop-up dialog here to say it works. So eventually if we click the button, that's the code that would run. We need to extend all of these shift register values so that way they get preserved from one iteration of the loop to the next. Let's try running and see how we're doing. Hey, it works. Let me also show you how to handle some of these features for causing the buttons to be reinitialized or perhaps having their appearance change uh, on initialization or for other steps. Again, I'm, I'm going through this quickly. You might need to pause and, and replay slightly here, but these are 
uh, the two ways of getting access to how you can manipulate the state of the button and then manipulate its appearance, whether or not it's enabled or or grayed out or disabled and grayed out, depends. And last of all, let's look at how one goes about creating this custom error code. Scroll down to the bottom of the list and you see custom error codes. They begin at 5,000. Let me go ahead and do 5050 as the error code number and then give it the text. Percent %s invokes a, a variable string that you can insert and then I connect the string that way. And there you go. That's the producer consumer state machine. It's an incredibly versatile and well-used design pattern and I hope that this tutorial video has given you the opportunity to get a better understanding of how it works and get a sense of how you can modify it for your own applications.